September 7, 1978, Georgi Markov, a Bulgarian expatriate living in London, was traveling to work. Following his usual routine, he parked his car and crossed Waterloo Bridge to wait for a bus. He had no idea that on this day, he was being watched. As Markov waited at the bus stop, he felt something sting his leg. He turned to see a man picking up an umbrella and running away. What seemed like a curious accident soon turned into an extraordinary mystery. Because three days later, Markov was dead. It seemed to me a reasonable way of actually committing uh, the perfect murder. The incident became legendary because of the way Markov was killed. It was one of the strangest tales of the Cold War, complete with poison, political intrigue, and ingenious gadgets. This was espionage, assassination, you know, sort of a, almost a, there's something rather James Bondish about this. But at its heart, Markov's murder was about the death of an innocent man and an act of petty spite carried out by a ruthless dictatorship. Despite many investigations, the perpetrators have never been brought to justice. The clues were present, but the proof was missing. Yet hidden in the Bulgarian state archives are crucial documents that reveal the full story of Markov's assassination. Even the killer himself can finally be named. He still live here and come and go. And he's a nomad, nomad. 30 years after the murder, the scientific and political mystery is finally being unraveled, at last revealing the truth about who killed Georgi Markov. When Markov checked himself into the hospital at 9 p.m. on September 8, 1978, he was convinced he had a serious problem. But in the ER, the doctors were skeptical of his bizarre story. It was a night Bernard Riley, the young doctor on duty, will never forget. It had been said in a rather humorous manner. In cubicle one, we have someone who's had a heart attack. In cubicle two, we have a road traffic accident uh, case. And in cubicle three, there's a man who's been shot by the KGB. No one was taking him seriously. In fact, I remember the look in his eyes. He was desperate for someone to listen to him and believe him. Riley took detailed notes about his patient's unlikely tale. From the very first, he said, I am a Bulgarian defector, I broadcast with the BBC, I have enemies in Bulgaria, and my friends have told me that the KGB are out to get me, were, were the exact words he used, and that he felt that he had been poisoned by the KGB and that he was going to die. To Riley, Markov seemed paranoid, possibly even insane. A physical examination did little to corroborate his story. When I first saw him, he was fully conscious. He was feverish, had a high temperature, and he had signs of uh, what could have been a, 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 a simple infection like influenza. He was complaining of nausea and vomiting, but he was also pointing uh, to an area on his right thigh, which he said was swollen and painful, and indicating that this was uh, the area in which he'd been shot, stabbed, or something had happened to him. But it could have been anything from an insect bite to being stabbed with a sharp metal object. Markov's conspiracy theory sounded far-fetched, and even his close friends didn't buy it. He had a bit of a reputation for telling tall tales. He was larger than life, and he used to boast quite a lot. Uh, for example, he boasted that he could catch a fly in mid-flight. He also boasted that he'd played football for the Bulgarian national team. And we always thought this was Georgie shooting a line, but it turned out it was true. I actually saw him catch flies in mid-flight, like this. I mean, don't ask me how he did it. Markov was an enigmatic character who had lived most of his life isolated from the West in Bulgaria under one of the most paranoid dictatorships in Eastern Europe. Bulgaria was the USSR's closest political ally, 
and its leader, President Tador Zhivkov, was a die-hard communist. Criticism of the regime was never tolerated. Zhivkov controlled a fearsome state security system with firm ties to the Russian KGB. За торжеството на комунистическите идеи, за мирното, щастливо бъдеще на нашите деца, за изпълнение на партийната програма, за развито социалистическо общество на нашето скъпо отечество. Закривам десетия конгрес на българската комунистическа партия. Despite the restrictions of the communist system, Georgi Markov became one of Bulgaria's most acclaimed writers in the 1960s. He was so influential, the president invited him on hunting weekends with other leading intellectuals. Markov enjoyed a privileged life until he began using his talents to speak out against the repressive regime. In 1969, when the authorities tried to stifle him by banning one of his novels and closing his plays, he defected to the West. I don't want to say that I am, let's say, braver or more honest than other people. Perhaps if I were more honest, I should have been there, because if you're honest, you should stay there and fight the battle there, not being here. But when I came here, I just felt an extremely human atmosphere, something resembling my childhood. And... Uh, this is exactly Britain in music for me. Like many other defectors from the Eastern Bloc, Markov made his way to London seeking sanctuary. He found work as a translator at the BBC and married Annabel Dilk in 1975. The following year, they had a daughter. But Markov's dissident past and his continued criticism of the Bulgarian regime haunted his new life. He began receiving ominous phone calls, warning him that his sedition would not go unpunished. They threatened to poison him and told Georgie that there was a phial of poison in the Bulgarian consulate or Bulgarian legation in Munich, which was actually named for Georgie. But again, we took that really as a rather exaggerated story, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Two days after the incident on Waterloo Bridge, it was no longer looking like an exaggeration. Markov's Cold War fantasy was turning into a real-life nightmare. His friend, David Phillips, visited him in intensive care. I shook hands with him when I left him, and his hand was stone cold, really like a dead person's hand and they immediately took his blood pressure, which was down almost to zero, and the doctor walked over to a telephone and dialed a number, and he said, I'm on ward such and such, and there's a patient here who's going up in a very big way. Markov's doctors were fighting to save his life. He developed an irregular heartbeat at quarter to eight in the morning, and essentially had a cardiac arrest. It was obvious that we were never going to get a stable heart rhythm and his metabolism was so deranged that, that death was inevitable and we stopped resuscitation after 45 minutes. At 10.40 a.m. on September 11th, Georgi Markov was pronounced dead. When the police discovered Markov was a defector, they immediately launched an investigation. Scotland Yard's anti-terrorist branch took Markov's story about being shot more seriously than the doctors had, but their investigation did not get off to a good start. We've spoken to several people who were actually on the bridge at the material times. Uh, none of these saw Markov or anything which would assist us. A taxi driver, according to the deceased, was seen to take away a person. Do you have any sort of description of this person now? None at all. No, we've come up with an absolute blank. The police couldn't find any eyewitnesses of the attack on Waterloo Bridge. 
all they had to go on was Markov's own account, which his widow Annabelle made public in an interview shortly after his death. He told me that he'd been jabbed with an umbrella tip. He, he, it was almost as if he, he didn't want to believe it himself. And I don't think he wanted to frighten me with it. But he showed me the mark that the umbrella had made. What was it like? It was like the point of a hypodermic. The press seized upon the detail of the umbrella. The case got more and more intriguing as details began to get out. Commander Neville, head of Scotland Yard's anti-terrorist branch, said it was clear that death was not due to natural causes. He said the Yard and other branches were treating the case as one of death under suspicious circumstances. The Western world watched, but back in Bulgaria, the news of Markov's death was censored by the government. His cousin Lyubin, who still lives next to the little house where Markov grew up, remembers how the family eventually found out. Nothing was mentioned officially or in the media. I heard about it from friends. I always knew that the state wouldn't let Georgi get away with his life. Markov's family had good reason to suspect that the Bulgarian government had played a part in his death. Since his defection, Markov had been considered an enemy of the state. After 1969, his name ceased to exist. He wasn't even mentioned. They removed his books from the libraries. They even scratched his name out of the credits of his films. From exile, Markov retaliated. He began writing scripts criticizing President Zhivkov for Radio Free Europe, an American station that broadcast into the Eastern Bloc. He mocked Zhivkov, calling him a minor dictator with a second-rate sense of humor. Despite communist attempts to jam the signal, half the population of Bulgaria was able to tune in to Markov's programs. He captured the primitivism and snobism of Zhivkov. He showed the ambitions of a mediocre man, an ill-educated, unintelligent man, and his Napoleonic ambitions. The fact that he alone wrote about Zhivkov in this unrestrained way provoked an enormous amount of hatred. Markov's colleague, Dmitry Batschev, also suspected foul play. This happened exactly on the birthday of Todor Zhivkov. I don't believe this was a coincidence. Zhivkov had given himself a birthday present. Back in London, the police questioned Markov's doctors, hoping to find out exactly what he had died from. His symptoms were too complex to have been caused by a simple infection. His blood pressure started to fall, his temperature dropped, and his white count rose. And all of those things indicate severe septic shock. He had been given the appropriate therapy to cover a wide spectrum of bacteria that could cause this and had not responded. And I was beginning to think about what else it could be. I really started to think that he might have, uh, it was some, could have been a snake venom, sort of a pit viper venom or something like that. To find out for sure, the police ordered an autopsy. They would need actual evidence of poisoning before they could start an official murder inquiry. Whatever killed Markov had left no trace in his bloodstream. But pathologist Rufus Crompton discovered that it had affected all his major organs. 
are definitely relevant changes in a large number of organs, mainly hemorrhages and or lymph glands in the groin on the right-hand side, which is the side the puncture mark was on, was swollen. This suggested to me that something had gone into the back of his leg, uh, which had travelled in the lymph up to the lymph glands and had there caused a reaction. The swollen lymph glands indicated that Markov's body had been fighting an extremely powerful poison. Crompton next had to figure out how to examine the tiny wound on Markov's thigh. I was wondering whether to cut into the puncture mark and down through it, and then I thought, well, no, there may be something in there apart from poisons. There may be, for instance, the tip of a needle or something, and I may well do more harm than good by poking around in it. Scotland Yard decided that the tissue around the wound should be handled by specialists. They chose Porton Down Laboratory, the UK's top research center for biochemical weapons during the Cold War. I think the fact that this was espionage or assassination, and there was an international flavor to it, you know, sort of a jaundice, there's something rather James Bondish about this. And Porton Down would be the right people to deal with that. Hidden in the English countryside, Porton Down was one of the most top secret scientific establishments in Britain. The lab took over the poison investigation and the analysis of Markov's thigh wound. They brought in experts from all over the world, including CIA chemical weapons specialist Christopher Green. My specialty as an intelligence officer was to study foreign advances in chemical and biological terrorism and chemical warfare. Porton Down was well known to me as being the best of the best in terms of being able to do analysis of foreign chemical weapons technology. So I knew that the people that were asking the questions were good, they were serious, and they were the best individuals that I could imagine wanting to work with. Green was at Porton Down when the team examining Markov's wound made an astonishing breakthrough. Sections of the tissue were being sliced and the prosector's knife blade struck something that he felt was metal, initially thinking that it was a needle, but a small plink sound occurred and it was very easy to see that it was a very tiny round ball bearing that looked like it came from the tip of a ballpoint pen. But on closer examination, the scientists realized it was too small to have come from a ballpoint pen. Intrigued, Scotland Yard brought the pellet back to London. They wanted the ballistics lab to take a look. I'd never seen anything like it before. I don't think anybody else had. I was asked to examine it, to find out what it was made of, uh, to investigate its nature, to produce some good quality uh, photographs in the electron microscope. When the Porton Down team had examined and cleaned the pellet, they had found no traces of poison. Now, as Keeley placed it on the microscope stand, he found the tiny ball extremely hard to handle. One had to be very careful that it didn't whiz out and disappear. I mean, it did several times for me. And I you know, had to get down on my hands and knees um, with a big beaker of water and sweep up all the dust off the floor and put it in the water. And finally, and much to my relief, um, the pellet dropped out with a satisfying ping and hit the bottom of the beaker. The electron microscope revealed that the pellet was made of platinum iridium, an inert alloy probably chosen because the body wouldn't reject it. There were also two tiny holes. The pellet itself was harmless. It clearly wasn't the pellet that killed him, it was what was in those holes. The two holes formed a tiny reservoir that could be filled with the concentrated toxin. Investigators theorized 
that the pellet was probably sealed with a gelatinous coating to keep the poison in place. When fired, the pellet would pass through clothing and flesh. Then the victim's body heat would melt the coating and release the poison into the bloodstream. There may have been some sugary material, a waxy material or whatever, which would uh, dissolve uh, or break up and allowing the material to release. But the poison itself remained a mystery. The reservoir in Markov's pellet was empty, so there was no way to identify the toxin. Just as the investigation seemed to be stalling, there was an unexpected breakthrough. News of a similar attack in Paris filtered through to Scotland Yard. Two weeks before the Markov incident, another Bulgarian dissident named Vladimir Kostov had felt something sting him in his back as he exited the metro. But unlike Markov, he had survived. Right, it's about here. At that moment, after we'd come out into the light, just before we got off the escalator, I felt something hit me in my back. I turned around, thinking it must have been thrown from the balcony behind me. After the attack, Kostov witnessed someone running away, but saw no sign of an umbrella. Shortly afterwards, he fell ill with exactly the same symptoms as Markov. When I realized that the pain wasn't going away, that's when I decided to go and see a doctor, and I began to think about what had happened. Kostov had a raging temperature, but after 48 hours, he began to recover. Like Markov, he was a Bulgarian defector, and he too had received mysterious death threats prior to the attempt on his life. Two weeks after the attack, when Kostov heard about Markov, he quickly put two and two together and contacted Scotland Yard. This was just the break the Markov team had been hoping for. If the attacker had used a similar pellet, perhaps it would still contain some of the poison for them to analyze. Following a small operation on September 25th, a section of flesh from Kostov's back was rushed to London for examination. The anti-terrorist squad phoned and said, look, can you stand by in the lab this evening? We've got some French police officers coming over from Paris, uh, and we think they've got an identical pellet. And they came in with a, a piece of body tissue taken from Kostov's back, which about as big as your thumb. And we x-rayed it, and there in the tissue was this little sphere, and we cut it, and there was a silvery pellet. Unfortunately, there were no traces of poison inside this pellet either. Since the pellets were so similar, it was likely the same poison had been used. But if so, how had Kostov survived when Markov did not? The police theorized that Kostov's clothing may have saved him. He had been wearing a heavy sweater on the day of the attack, so they believed the pellet had not penetrated as deeply meaning less poison would have reached his bloodstream. But since there were still no samples of the poison, their theory could not be tested. They needed another way to isolate the toxin. To identify what was in those, first of all, you say, well, how much was there? Um, so you, you've, in, in order to do that, you've got to carefully measure the dimensions of the holes and calculate the volume. The holes could hold just two-tenths of a milligram of poison. Two-tenths is a minuscule amount, ten times smaller than a lethal dose of cyanide. They were dealing with something terrifyingly powerful, and only a handful of toxins fit the profile. High on the list were poisons like plutonium, abrin, ricin, some snake venoms, and some other things even like very purified botulinum, but that didn't appear to be the set of poisons that were highest on the list as abrin and ricin, which were known to be particularly dangerous if injected into the bloodstream. Both ricin and abrin can kill in microscopic amounts. 
Spreading from the site of injection, they attack cells and cause vital organs to shut down. Since abrin was extremely rare, ricin seemed like the more likely culprit. The fact that those lymph glands were swollen in the groin, and when I cut into them, they were full of hemorrhage. When I saw small hemorrhages throughout the other organs in the body, especially in the heart, and that also fitted in, and so they sort of looked at each other and said, right, ricin. But could such a devastating reaction have been caused by such a small amount of the poison? Ricin is a natural product of a number of plant materials, but most notably in high concentration in something called the castor bean. And in fact, castor oil, which is an oil from the castor bean, is completely safe to take. But when the molecule is purified, it happens to be probably one of the top one or two or three toxic materials known to man by weight. Even in tiny doses, ricin can wreak havoc on the body's nervous system. Ricin is particularly known to have a neurotoxic effect because of its peculiar ability to seek out and preferentially destroy very active nerve cells. There's nothing more active in the nervous system than cells that are, for example, pacemakers of the heart. Scientists had plenty of data about the effects of castor bean poisoning, but these were the first known cases of someone injected with concentrated ricin. To ensure that their assumptions were correct about Markov's murder, the Port and Down team decided to test a small dose of ricin on an animal subject. The only way to really come to a definite conclusion was to do a, a biological experiment. So they got a pig, which is the same size and weight, well, the same weight as Markov. The pig was injected with ricin, roughly the same amount that could have gone into the pellet, and it became seriously ill and eventually died. And they then examined the organs in the pig and found almost identical changes to those in Markov. So I concluded that this was a, was a toxemia, in other words, a, a poisoning of the blood, uh, due to metallic foreign body implantation. But if the poison was in fact ricin, where had it come from? The Bulgarian Secret Service was not technically capable of manufacturing this lethal toxin. So if they were really to blame for the murder, they must have had help from a partner with far more experience producing secret assassination weapons. The obvious collaborator was the KGB. We knew that for many years the Soviet laboratories had specifically been doing research on Abrin and Ricin. We're talking about both open literature and classified literature that showed that the laboratories that the KGB acquired information from in the former Soviet Union were the laboratories that were associated with state-sponsored chemical and biological warfare research. So there was ample reason for them to be leaders in this research. We knew that. At a secret location in Florida, intelligence historian Keith Melton has amassed a comprehensive collection of spy gadgets from the Cold War. He has spent many years researching the Soviet assassination capabilities. Many of the prized KGB objects in Melton's collection came from a clandestine weapons lab known as Number 12. Laboratory Number 12 was a secret laboratory in a small building not employing more than six people. The technicians in Laboratory 12 would specifically be the biochemists. They would be doctorate level graduates of Moscow University with advanced degrees. They would be individuals who were passionately working on biological warfare. At the time of Markov's murder, the Soviets had built up a massive biochemical weapons program. They had intercontinental missiles filled with weapons grade smallpox. So it was not hard to believe they were capable of producing the concentrated ricin needed for an assassination. 
the delivery system and murder plan also bore the hallmarks of a KGB operation. The Russian intelligence service has learned from the very beginning that assassinations are best done if they can be quiet and unnoticed and appear natural. They wanted something that gave the target a plausible reason to believe indeed this was an accident. The question is, at what point would you make the attack? Would you do it when he's getting out of a car? Would you do it when he's walking up steps, which would be extremely difficult? Or would you do it when he's standing at a bus stop? While he's in the queue, he's stationary. Now, the one common thing that is always unnoticed in, in London would be umbrellas. He could logically be jabbed or prodded in an accidental way by another traveler or passerby. Within 24 to 48 hours, the person would die. The appearance would be a heart attack. And when they put all these factors together, an umbrella became the likely solution. It's the one they selected. They had many options to choose from. The KGB developed a number of secret assassination devices during the Cold War. Pens, lighters, even canes. Melton has acquired many samples, but his most prized piece is an authentic KGB umbrella gun. This is a cutaway model of the type that I believe was used in the assassination of Georgi Markov. And it started as a conventional commercial umbrella, but it has several modifications. The button which you would normally release the umbrella is actually the firing trigger. Once it's depressed, it releases gas stored in this cylinder, which is injected into this chamber, which forces a tiny pellet out through the tip. The umbrella gun fit neatly with the account Markov had given before he died. But Vladimir Kostov is not convinced. He had not seen such a weapon when he was shot. I don't think it was an umbrella, because you just don't need something so complicated. You don't need to make a weapon by modifying an umbrella, when you can just use something smaller. I think that in both cases they used a little weapon, that kind of thing. You know, you can even modify a pen or something small to fire a shot. Perhaps there had been more than one weapon, but even so, the operation pointed to the Bulgarians with support from the KGB. The evidence that this was the Bulgarian service acting with technology that came from Russian laboratories was circumstantial evidence. But the circumstantial evidence added together was very powerful. The clues were present, but the proof was missing. The proof was locked deep behind the Iron Curtain hidden beneath the cloaks of the communist regimes. By the end of 1979, the Scotland Yard investigation into Markov's murder had ground to a halt. For 10 years, the case lay dormant. Then came the collapse of the Eastern Bloc. In early 1990, just months after the fall of the Berlin Wall, it was Bulgaria's turn to celebrate. With riots spreading across the capital, President Tador Zhivkov was deposed and placed under house arrest on charges of corruption. With the removal of the dictator and after nearly half a century of communist rule, Bulgaria took its first small steps away from its oppressive past. What was once one of the most secretive countries in Eastern Europe began opening itself up to outside influence and scrutiny. Jack Hamilton was one of the first Western journalists to move to the new Bulgaria. When he arrived in the capital city of Sofia, there was great hope that the Markov case might finally be solved. In 1990, the British thought that this was an opportunity to open up the case and to start working with the Bulgarians. 
What the British investigation needed was information from the archives of the uh, Bulgarian Foreign Intelligence Service, the former state security. Everyone knew or assumed that the Bulgarian authorities were, were behind this murder, but who had actually committed it was completely unknown. Or was it? After the fall of the Soviet Union, former KGB general Oleg Kalugin told the press that he had been present at the meeting in Moscow where Markov's assassination had been planned. According to Kalugin, the request for assistance in killing Georgi Markov had come directly from Bulgaria's communist president, Tador Zhivkov. But Zhivkov never admitted his connection to the Markov murder. This has never sat well with Jack, who believes more pressure should have been put on the Bulgarian government to admit responsibility. You always have to come back to the fact that there's this man who was the number one enemy of the regime and he was attacked on Waterloo Bridge, there's a pellet in his thigh, three days later he was dead. Someone killed him and the Bulgarian state is in the frame. One of Jack's first assignments in Bulgaria was to attend a press conference given by the former president shortly after his release from house arrest. Jack was the only journalist who dared to ask him about the Markov case. Zhivkov made a joke about it. And he made a joke about the umbrella, which made me very angry. Well, I remember when I asked the question, there was a sort of stir. The fact that I was uh, asking about an incredibly important uh, part of the history of Bulgaria to um, the man who, who was responsible for what happened, you know, the, 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 the former dictator. Jack never had the chance to interview Zhivkov again. The ex-president died of pneumonia not long after his release. However, Bulgaria did make some efforts to deal with the Markov case. In 1991, the new post-communist government opened its own investigation into the murder. After years of disappointment for Markov's family and friends, there was finally a glimmer of hope. The Bulgarian policeman assigned to the case was Bogdan Karyatov. For a brief period, Karyatov was given access to secret archives from the communist era. He found crucial documents containing proof that Markov had been a target of Bulgarian state security. We discovered that Markov's name first appears in the official records in 1974. We found Markov's card index record, which said his code name was Skitnik, and that means Tramp. The dossier dated from the period when Markov was writing scripts denigrating President Zhivkov for Radio Free Europe. The file contained tantalizing clues about how the communists had planned to deal with him. We found a document in the archive of the Foreign Intelligence Department which said there were plans for Georgi Markov to be neutralized. That's exactly how it was written, neutralized. But we couldn't find out what the plans were because the relevant documents had disappeared. Someone had disposed of the documents illegally. They'd been destroyed. The missing pages were a critical setback for Karyatov. When he dug deeper, he found that General Vladimir Todorov, a former head of state security during the communist period, had been responsible for destroying the missing pages. Todorov fled to Moscow, but eventually returned to Bulgaria to face trial. He was sentenced to 16 months in prison, then released 
six months later. Still hoping for more details about Todorov's involvement in the murder, Jack has tracked him down at an association for former state security officers. What kind of a Todorov? I custom say John Hamilton. Not surprisingly, Tadarov wants nothing to do with Jack's questions. But his initial flight to Moscow was a clear indication of Bulgaria's ties to Mother Russia. As a high-ranking intelligence officer, he had worked closely with the KGB. Todorov destroyed those documents because the entire Bulgarian state security um, was uh, incredibly co closely li linked to the, to, to, to the Russian KGB. He was protecting both his own government and the Russians, who never admitted to playing any part in the murder. Because of his military status, Todorov was never properly interrogated by Officer Karyatov. Even so, Karyatov continued his investigation, intent on finding evidence that would reveal the assassin. He was very dogged about following up the leads that he found in the archives, and this is really where um, the first clues about um, how um, the, the Bulgarian state of, of arranged his murder came to light. Eventually, Karyatov unearthed a crucial file that would blow the case wide open. The documents not only confirmed that Markov was a target, they even named the individual who was selected to kill him. We found the name of an agent working for the Bulgarian intelligence service in the documents. He was based in Denmark and had been assigned to deal with Markov. The documents said that the agent was codenamed Piccadilly and he'd been given instructions about dealing with Georgi Markov. Galino settled in Copenhagen. He posed as an art dealer traveling around Europe in a van. The files confirmed that Galino had made several trips to London right around the time Markov was killed. He was sent from Denmark to England for 40 days in 1977 and stayed close to the house where Markov lived. Karyatov passed his information on to Scotland Yard and together they were able to track down Galino in Copenhagen, where he was brought in for questioning by the Danish police. In February 1993, investigators from Britain, Bulgaria and Denmark secretly interrogated Galino about his work for Bulgarian state security and about his involvement in the Markov case. The police tried to keep the interrogation secret but the story was leaked to Danish journalist Ola Damker. I had a tip here in Copenhagen that there was a, an Italian guy involved in the, in the Markov case. And he had been, been charged with uh, espionage. But the interesting thing is that apparently they, they were lacking uh, evidence. Uh, so they gave up the case and, and he was free to leave. I mean, he left for Hungary. So, so they didn't try to, to keep him back. It could be that that it could be somehow embarrassing for the, for the Danish authorities uh, if, if, if there was a court case and Mr. Golino told what he, what he actually had been doing in Denmark since 74, how he was, how he, he, how he was allowed to come here. And, but, but that's speculation, but, but you can speculate about 
a lot of things because it was during the Cold War. Despite the evidence in Bulgaria against him, it appears the Danes had little interest in keeping Galino in prison. Even though he admitted to espionage, he said he had no connection to the Markov case and was quickly released. He sold his house and left Denmark soon afterwards. Once he disappeared, there were no more official efforts to track Galino down. But Jack Hamilton has located several people in Copenhagen who claim to have known him. People are not really keen to speak about him at all. I think they're perhaps frightened to, to talk about the, the fact that they knew him and what he was like. I have found one person who has agreed to speak to me about Francesco Galino, but he's also very frightened and c concerned not to be identified. Jack's source has known Galino on and off for over 15 years. They first met when Galino owned a picture framing business. How do you know Francesco Galino? I uh, met him the first time in the early 89. He was a little man with a small moustache. He talked very fast and uh, he has a bright mind. Did he talk about personal things, for instance? No, never, never on personal things. I have the feeling that he was uh, a very lonely man. He's a nomad. Nomad, nomad. How did you feel when this news came out that Francesco Gulino, who you knew, was said was, to be connected with Georgi Markov's death? I was shocked. I was shocked. And, and, and What did he say? Okay, of course, I, I asked him, but he couldn't understand that a secret <laughs> service could do things like that uh, because he was... Only a small man, a little man. And we don't spoke more about it. Well, what, what does he do now, today? But he's, uh, is, is, he, is, he, is he alive? He, yes, uh, common friends uh, meet him uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, and he still live here and, and come and go. And, so so uh, and, and, and I, uh, I don't have... Uh, I want... I don't want uh, to have any trouble. Jack has found other sightings of Galino all over Europe. In 2002, a wire service even reported his arrest at the German border for smuggling, though it seems he was released without ever being charged. Since I've been in Copenhagen, I've seen people who appear to be close to him who were really quite frightened of him. Um, and so this, you know, gives an impression of, of Galino as, you know, being a man who's, um, who's involved in, um, you know, some, some perhaps some, some questionable businesses. I've even been spoken to um, an, an art dealer who said he saw him here in Copenhagen as recently as two years ago. Um, this is amazing. Uh, it seems that uh, that, that, that uh, Gulino is um, is working and and and, and travelling th throughout Europe, and the uh, authorities don't appear to be interested in him at all. Francesco Gulino has never publicly commented on the allegations that he is responsible for the murder of Georgi Markov. Jack tried to approach Gulino through his connections in Copenhagen, but they were all afraid to help him make contact. In Britain, Markov's murder is still under inquiry, which means Scotland Yard will not comment on the current status of the case. The Bulgarians did recently agree to let Jack interview Andrei Svetanov, the current police officer assigned to the investigation. But there is little new movement to discuss. This is, this is the entire Markov case. Uh, 80% of the documents point to the account that Markov was killed by a Bulgarian state security agent or someone who worked for them. It's all pointing towards that account. More than 80% in that direction. But we need 100%. Under our law, every doubt has to be in the interest of the accused, 
Proof has to be beyond reasonable doubt. But perhaps there is another reason for the Bulgarians' reluctance to move forward. There is a statute of limitations on the case that runs out in September 2008. After that, the investigation will be closed forever. Unfortunately, that's how it's decided in our law. In the case of this crime, the statute of limitations is 30 years. Even if the suspect is found, he can't be prosecuted in our courts if the statute has run out. Allowing the statute to run out suits the Bulgarians just fine. They are currently applying for membership in the European Union and are doing all they can to play down the impact of their communist past. Reopening the Markov case would be an embarrassment and a political risk. I think they're just trying to forget their past. Joining the EU hasn't meant in Bulgaria facing up to, to what the communist regime did. On the contrary, I think that they feel that um, looking into these things would, would, would be, would be p painful and, and distracting for them. Uh, and there's no political will to, to do that at all. Even if no individual is ever brought to trial, Vladimir Kostov, the other poison pellet victim, still feels that the Bulgarian government should publicly acknowledge their crimes from the communist era. I don't seek anything. I am not looking for the person who fired the shot into me or into Markov. Perhaps it's the same person. I am not looking for the person who ordered it either. I understand very well that it was a political matter. So it should be treated as a political matter. It's not about blaming an individual who simply executed orders and obeyed the laws of a regime. It's about getting rid of this poisoned legacy of the Cold War. Markov's family feels the same way. They are not as concerned with the identity of the trigger man as they are with an apology from the Bulgarian government. They want an official admission that Georgi Markov was the victim of a political assassination. Yet 30 years after the killing, the authorities remain silent. They are as eager to forget as the Markovs are to remember. The family continues to live with the quiet frustration of an officially unresolved murder. The names aren't important. The finger that did it isn't important. But the mind that thought it up is. 